Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hi, my name is Frank Lavinia. I am COO of Data Leader at dataleader.io and uh, I'm here with Andy Leonard, my wonderful trusty co-host. And this is the first episode of Data Driven. Say hello to the nice folks, Andy. Hello, nice folks. So uh, what do you do for a living, Andy? Oh, um, mostly these days I am um, I'm writing, I'm building uh, tools to support data integration, lifecycle management, uh, managing a, a couple of teams that are out doing real work. Uh, they're consultants at Enterprise Data and Analytics. And uh, really just enjoying life here in rural Farmville, Virginia. Yeah, and you actually live in Farmville, the, the actual city, not not that you're really hooked on that, that online game. Right, not the game. I tell people that a lot. I live in Farmville, not the game. It's kind of now <laughs> some hyphenated uh, words after the name of the town, yes. Um, and I think your business card says you're a data philosopher. Yep, yep. That's uh, my official title. Um I, uh, I don't feel smart enough to be a uh, data scientist, but um, I do some of that kind of work. And uh, I have this long beard, which I think goes well with uh, the term philosopher. So, yes. Yeah, totally. Totally. But are you a unicorn? No. Or, or maybe. I don't know. Um, we were just talking about that book before we started this recording. Um, and, uh, Frank, why don't you mention uh, some more about the book? You just started reading it. It's a couple years old. Yeah, it's not a new book. Uh, I was actually got an email that I had credit with Audible, and uh, that doesn't last very long. And uh, I just, for fun, I searched for data science kind of audiobooks, and I didn't expect to really find anything. Um, then I saw a book called Unicorns Among Us, and I had to buy it, of course. Yeah. Um, but it's a book by Lars Nielsen. And uh, it basically talks about how there's a real shortage of of data people with skills to be data scientists. Um, and the reason why they're called unicorns is because the people with these types of skills are about as rare as unicorns. Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting read um, or an interesting listen. And uh, I'll put the note the link to the book in the show notes. And. Uh, yeah, I, I really found it insightful and it kind of, you know, justifies my decision to go from kind of, you know, Windows 10 UWP developer to data scientist, which uh, is something that I kind of did in my previous role at Microsoft. Right. But enough about that. Uh, I hear we have Jen Underwood here with us today. And uh, did you uh, did you want to do the intro, Andy? Sure, I'd, I'd be honored to. Uh, Jen is a friend and uh, someone I admire a great deal. Uh, speaking of data scientists, Jen is a data scientist. And um, she's been doing training and blogging for years. Um, she's uh, uh, worked at Microsoft. She's had experience with non-Microsoft tools. Um, and she's just one of those people who, in my opinion, has a ton of credibility when it comes to talking about data science and all of the tools and all of the different companies that are, are operating uh, in this ecosphere. Uh, Jen is a founder of Impact Analytics, LLC, and she's a recognized analytics industry expert, and uh, she's got a, a unique blend of product management and design. And it says here, I'm reading from your uh, about page on your blog, uh, Jen, which is jenunderwood.com, that uh, for over 20 years, which... I think means you started when you were six. Is that correct? <laughs> no. Um, okay. So uh, a lot of hands-on development with data warehousing, reporting, visualization, and advanced analytics solutions. Um, I had this opportunity. I'm not going to read the rest of jenunderwood.com slash about. Go read the rest yourself. It's very impressive. And I had this opportunity, um, I guess it was back in September, you did a pre-con for a SQL Saturday in North Carolina. I can't remember if it was Charlotte or Raleigh. I think it was Charlotte. And I, I got to attend that, and it really reignited my passion for uh, data science and, you know, and analytics. And I, I had been doing – I used to do reporting, Jen, back in the old days. And um, I hadn't done a lot of it in maybe 10, 12, 15 years. 
and the tools have really come a long way since then. And you just really reignited that passion. I love the way you taught that pre-con. It was very much uh, the story of how Jen learned to, to do this. And we're very honored to have you have you here, especially on our first, uh, our very first podcast. So welcome, Jen. Oh, Andy, that was such a sweet intro. I love this stuff. Um, and I very rarely give classes, by the way. So that was um, Jason Thomas was the one that asked me, and I, I couldn't say no. At some point, I've got to do it again. I had really great feedback. It's just not something I normally do. But thank you. Yeah, I've had a lot of experience in this space. And yes, I'm, I'm in my midlife. What is it? 40 somethings. And, um, you know, going, Oh my God, 50. No, (laughs) no. Um, but what I do like is that because I've played with all these tools, I'm now working with lots of different vendors, many startups and that type of thing. It's been an interesting journey from hands-on playing, absolutely loving this, to selling it for Microsoft, to marketing it for Microsoft, to helping design it, and then going out on my own. And it's always scary when you first do that, but I've I've kind of have it have it a nice groove going now. So now it's just it's pretty fun. I just have to load balance and you know figure out at some point how to scale this a little better. I have one fellow that's with me and he's a former SQL Server sales rep of mine. And we've got a good, you know, working groove because we've known each other forever. Um, so that certainly helps. But yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey, a different one than, than probably a lot of folks take. So how did you get into um, the data world? Oh, that's an easy one. So I found out I fell in love with data and I had business, I went to business school and there was marketing research, statistical process control, and a couple different stats classes. And I was the annoying kid that'd be like, give me your data. Can I see your data? Uh, Oh, how about David? Just take a look at your data set. (laughs) Oh yeah, I just, I just need you. And that, I, at the time it was in Wisconsin. That's the funny accent. They had just built this new computer lab. I was in there, and I might have four or five different, because there's nobody in there. Um, I may have four or five different computers running, different data sets on different machines. I was slinging HTML code and Notepad. It was just the right place, right time, and oh my God, I love it. I love I still love data. I still say, hey, give me your data set. Let me just take a look at that. Uh, it, it's a sickness. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Kind of, kind of <laughs> that is funny. Well, uh, Jen, what, what would you say your favorite part of your current gig is? I think right now it's when people approach me. So I usually have, oh, I don't know, maybe a call a day with different startups around the world. And, you know, they're pitching their concept and they're showing me what they're building and wanting input on this. And it's fun to see some of the innovators, you know, some of the conversations are a little difficult when they think they have something new, but I've already seen it three times in one week by other people. Um, So from that perspective, but it's helping folks now, you know, from a practitioner perspective say, yeah, I don't care about that. Or this would be beautiful. Or if you just took this, this feature or this solution and maybe thought about this, this, and this. It's helping them. Then you see them, you know, they, they'll come back to you a couple months later. They may have implemented your idea. You're like, well, that was neat. Um, so, yeah, it, I think that's what I enjoy the most right now is just helping other people bridge what I would say good solutions or good ideas to, to something practical. Well, very cool. Um, I'm going to go off script here just a minute, but I want to ask this question because I think a lot of our listeners would be interested in thinking, or sorry, in hearing your thoughts about where you think data science is going. Ooh, automated. Yeah? So, yeah, I see a lot of automation. And, at, you know, the beginning is before this call, you're talking about this this huge skills gap. I'm very skeptical on that. I know there's there's a need for data folks in general, but once it gets to the cloud and once some of the algorithms are in place, we'll need a few people to customize it. But I see so much automation in this space 
that it's it, even in the data prep side now that's getting very interesting. Project Farcast from IBM is something I'm tracking very closely. Um, I don't think at any point every single thing will be automated, but I think we're going to see a heck of a lot more of it. Interesting. So you think the robots will be coming for the data science jobs? Yes, I do. Interesting. I do. I can see that. I mean, uh, the demand right now is so high. It, it definitely, for for startups or companies that want to innovate in that space, there's certainly a lot of um, demand for that. Um, but I guess uh, eventually the robots will be taking over all our jobs. So, well, yeah, um... you keep hearing about <laughs> universal base income, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to rebel. I, I don't want to. <laughs> I am. Oh, you think I'm kidding? I'm over it. Uh, no, I want to have the opportunity to make a living and be creative and not just be given a check and told to go away. No. Right. So, right. not to get political, but I am not for that. I, I want folks to have, I think, too, when you have idle minds, you, they just it just throws trouble. I mean, people need to feel engaged and work brings so much meaning, at least hopefully, at least in my, in my world, it brings so much meaning. Um, and purpose and giving back that I can't imagine just being idle. I'm sure there's other ways folks can work, but yeah, I'm a little nervous about this whole robots and you know, how, how the governments are going to figure this out, what to do. It'll, it, it is an interesting question from kind of a policy point of view, because, you know, obviously you have the economic and the socioeconomic things of it too, but from a government's point of view, how do you tax a robot? You know, a robot doesn't make any income. One of my customers has a ton of bots and they go nuts anytime I tweet. And I actually asked them, I said, you know, here's the deal. You know, I don't mind helping you with some things here and there, but I'm, I don't want to do any more social because I know I'll never get business from bots and it's drowning out my real customers. Interesting. Yeah, wow. that's actual real life. I had that conversation with someone last month that um, it just, it did, it just drowns, it just drowns it out and, and I'll never get business from a bot ever. Um, so yeah, this, this whole world in the bots and, and I think what's fascinating, I show, I have an industry trend session and I show a, a robot called Sophia. I'm, I'm imagining she's got to be a heck of a lot smarter and she looks like a human. She has interactions. She can banter back and forth with you. She can raise her eyebrows and make all these different facial expressions in your, if you, if she didn't have, you know, a piece of the, you know, I guess you would say the skull open to tell it's a robot. I bet you may not even know, and that's really that's, scary. And that was that's last crazy. I mean, year. That's... That was last year. So I haven't seen Sophia this year, but she's probably even looking even more realistic. That's crazy. That's that's Blade Runner. Yes, that's Blade yes, Runner type stuff. Exactly. It's getting so really maybe crazy. that's where the jobs will be. You could be a Blade Runner. Well, well, I did talk to somebody. So he talked about it was funny. Um, so he's in the robotics space. A, a very good friend of mine, Matesh Patel, is probably one of my best friends in the whole world. And I talked to Matesha about this and said, you know, I want to know what you're seeing in robotics you know, and what's happening there because I have this fear, right, this anxiety of, of, of unemployment in, in this, this scenario of this crazy world. And he told me there's, there's going to be some new jobs, things like drones. And a drone driver in their last event was paid 1000 bucks an hour to fly this little thing around the event. So what he was saying is there'll be different types of jobs, new jobs. Uh, will, will pop up while other ones will certainly go away. Right. And I think that's another thing, too. I think there's a lot of, you know, wringing of hands and mashing of teeth about, you know, the job apocalypse. But I, I think if you take kind of the long view of it, you know, how many people till the fields today? Um, how yeah. many people, you know, pick any kind of job that has been thoroughly automated? The world didn't end. We're all doing different things. Right. Um, yeah. You know, banks are a great example. You know, how many tellers are there at banks today? But you can still do your banking from your phone at an ATM. <laughs> my, um, my dad will not go to a, a – will, will not do his banking online. He needs to see a teller. He's very, <laughs> he's funny about that. Yeah, that's definitely cool. You know, one of the things that I, I talk about, Jen, when I, when I talk about automation, and I'm not um, – I'm not in your your end of the data science stuff yet, although I'm working on it. I, again, you, and it's all your fault. You uh, you reignited Aww. that passion. Um, but one of the things I tell people when I talk about automation in general is uh, think about life maybe 200 years ago, where people spent you know hours every day trying to just stay alive, just trying to find enough food for that day. 
And what Frank mentioned earlier kind of triggered this, the, the whole automation around agriculture where a single person can now feed thousands uh, of people. And we spend maybe 15 minutes each day worrying about the food for the day. Um, and, and what's happened is uh, farmers haven't gone out of business. That work hasn't gone away. Uh, it's just gotten way more efficient. And the job market in that particular skill set has been reshaped. And, and what I see coming is that very same kind of reshaping now taking place. And you look at what the cloud did for uh, the typical on-premises DBA is uh, not just the cloud, but automation in general. It made that DBA able to manage 10 times as many servers, 10 times as many databases. And then that happened again with even better and more automation. Um, so I, I completely agree. I see all of these many cycles where automation is making us achieve efficiencies we couldn't imagine even 10 years ago. And uh, that's one benefit of being in the field for more than a decade is being able to watch this pattern repeat itself. And I don't know how you feel about this idea of the singularity, Jen. Um, I, I'm like you in that I won't stop creating whether there are machines that can do it differently or better. Um, I'll die building things, but, um, <laughs> but you too. know, I, I think I think it's possible. You you could certainly see things progressing towards that point. And I've heard lots of estimates about when a machine will be able to think like a human, which I have some uh, uh, non-unique thoughts about that. I, I I watched the imitation game again earlier this week, and uh, there's a part in there where Turing is talking about. Um, why you, Why would you ever want to have a machine think like a human? Uh, I completely agree. Why would you want to dumb them down, right? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, did I, did I, Frank, edit that piece out if you would. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. No, I like it. I, I started my career at a help desk, and and uh, my my I believe that natural stupidity um, is way stronger than artificial intelligence ever could be. <laughs> I love that. Now, I promise I'm not picking on on users when I when I say that. I do think that you know machines um, are definitely more efficient at doing things, some things than people, and I think we're going to see that kind of multiplier continue. And it's usually, um, you know, what, what I see happening, and I don't know, Jen, maybe you see this, uh, Frank, maybe you, maybe you don't, but I see these things coming in fits and starts, where um, you know we get some piece of automation and you know, that just creates all of this time that people are able to then use doing other stuff and they get so much more efficient and either they're able to do, you know, multiply, say 10 times or a hundred times or a thousand times and, and manage more stuff. Um, or if they're in the more creative fields and I feel data science is a very creative field. Um, we get better and faster at achieving our goals, which are running experiments, observing the results and being able to report back to someone in business, hey, this is what's really going on. This is the, you know, here's the answer to the problem you're trying to solve. No, absolutely. I think, um, I think, and, and, and the way this conversation has kind of, have, has turned from kind of data science, data visualization to artificial intelligence and robots and kind of back to this, I mean, it really speaks how all of this is interrelated. I mean, what's going to train the machines is going to be large data sets. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I blog quite a bit and, uh, you know, um, I look at the word cloud tag and it's all basically IOT data and, you know, AI and people are kind of like, well, how are those related? And I was like, well, they are very related. I mean, they're yeah, all, they you're a three legged stool. Yeah, they're totally related. So even when I was showing Sophia, right, what makes Sophia be able to interact with you and, and it's, it's, it's the cognitive analytics. It's essentially machine learning algorithms, neural networks in the background doing that. Right. And it's, it, it I, for me, I mean, I, it's, it's a fascinating time to, to be in this field because so much innovation is happening so fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fast. Um, it, you just can't keep up. It's almost the innovations are coming out day to day. And I think that speaks to something what you said, Andy, where, um, you know, the migration to the cloud, it may have kind of shifted a lot of what DBAs can do, but it's also enabled whole new classes of startups to just come into existence just by, you know, flipping a bit on, you know, or signing up for Amazon or Azure. Right, right. 
And this is the point in the show where we thank our sponsors who make Data Driven possible. You know, on Data Driven, we talk a lot about data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But did you know the hardest part of any data science related project is data integration? Data scientists often call data integration, data wrangling, or the icky word, munging. But it's all about making sure the analytics engine that you're using has valid and clean data. Enterprise Data and Analytics specializes in data integration and can help your enterprise build better data integration solutions faster with best practices and automation. Enterprise Data and Analytics offers training and consulting services for SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, and Business Intelligence Markup Language, or BIML. Visit entdna.com to learn more. Enterprise Data and Analytics. Data, it's in their DNA. And, it, you know, Jen, you blog about a lot of these startups and a lot of companies that are building some of the automation tools. And, uh, you know, just it's it's just thing on top of thing on top of thing. I, I, um, I follow your blog and I get the emails when you post. And it's just amazing to keep up with uh, not, not only the technology, but I find it very interesting, your evaluations of it, because you have perspective uh, and, you know, you have width and depth. Uh, in in this field, you've been doing it for years. Um, you've worked with different technologies. You've seen how other people have solved these problems. Um, tell us a little bit about that that market. That's an interesting market, I think. I, I'm sure that uh, these people reach out to you and ask you to review their uh, their product. And your product management experience, I think, is invaluable uh, in that space. So speak a little bit about that, if you would. Sure, it's it's really quite fun. Uh, typically, what you'll find is there's quite a few industry analysts that are out there. If you think about, and, and here's a fun factoid, I actually went through some rounds with Gartner. I just didn't think that, um, I, I withdrew. I didn't think I'd be able to enjoy the not being creative because it's just such a huge part of who I am. Uh, of you know, I, The last blog I did, or one I'm, I'm enjoying, I should say, is the buyer spoof on the bachelor of all these mm. different tools. And it's just fun. I would never get to do that if I was with one of these industry analyst firms, but I have a blend and I do a lot of the same types of work that they do. I, the hands-on experience definitely makes me fairly unique there. Cindy Housen has hands-on. She has a former implementation background back in the day. So we're a lot alike. We think a lot alike. It's really fun to meet her and, and to talk with her when I get to do that. Uh, but most of the industry analysts, they've never really worked or, or had to deploy or any of that. You know, they just analyze the market. So that makes me a little yeah. bit different, that piece. Also, I think the other piece that makes me a bit different in this, in my particular space, is that I've seen the product development and design side, and, you know, some of the choices, and you're like, why on earth did they do that? Um, there is a lot, there, there's a lot of times things just don't seem to make sense. But if you're trying to appease different areas of an organization like Microsoft, for instance, you do things that don't make sense. So oh, I've certainly seen that. It, it's been really interesting. So I'm taking what it is, this marketing creative spirit that I can't, I just can't suffocate the spirit. It, it's impossible to do it. Take, and don't. Yeah, I can't. Don't I, do I it. I can't. I won't. It's just part of who I am. I'll make. I'll make less money. I don't even mind if I can be creative. I'll do that. Um, so I've blended this creative, whatever you want to call this crazy spirit of mine, with the industry analysis, and that's the blend that I'm offering. And it's been really neat to see, I guess, the how many people think they're unique or they come to me with a solution. Here's data visualization or software as a service on the cloud. And there's a lot that you don't see on my blog that I'm like, thank you. This is really nice. And you've done a nice job. And, and usually I'll open up the conversation with, you know, after a few minutes of hearing the spiel, I'm like, bottom line in one minute, tell me what makes you unique and beautiful and, and different than, than all the other ones. And the really sharp ones that are successful will be able to nail that question. Most groups don't really know, or they, they say, well, we have natural language query, or we have 
Um, this data visualization, it's drag and drop. It's like, yeah, so does right. several hundred other people. Um, and it's been really, that that question one is very revealing, um, you know, to understand the market. But yeah, it, it's because of cloud, it's so easy to put D3JS and HTML5. And, you know, there's all these different frameworks to get started with web apps and software as a service with subscriptions is just so, I want, I, I want my own SaaS app. Oh my gosh. It's just so <laughs> lucrative. Seriously, my please. I'll market it. Just give me one. I, I got to have one. I, I want that too. But it is so appealing. We're just seeing thousands of them pop up. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah, you, you, you know, you have to wonder, you know, is this a bubble that's going to pop or is it going to continue in terms of the, the SaaS world or is it just going to just shake out and then, you know, people just march on? with something else? Well, that's a great question because I certainly see some similarity in this space, at least with data science right now and data visualization and anything data related. People are going crazy with it. They can get money with it. And I, I do think the top five, was it, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, you know, those big players certainly have a huge advantage in the digital transformation. So we'll see some drop off because at some point, you know, some folks are not going to, to make it. I still think, though, we'll have, like, I talked to one today, and I have the same question, what makes you unique and beautiful and different? I've seen natural language search already a couple times this week. Um, it is cool. It's going to be it's gonna be standard in tools by most of the tools by next year. Um, I think that surprised him. But, you know, he says to me, well, we're really popular in India. And I says, oh, okay, that's that's what makes you somewhat unique then. It's your, your hometown company. You know, go with that because um, there's a lot to be said about supporting somebody in your own local region. I had another group in Germany, massively successful database called Exasol. I, I did market research for them. I'm talking to their customers. and like, why on earth have I not heard about these guys before? And I looked, they had the, the TP, top TPCH rating. I'm like, geez, because I never freaking look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I don't got no reason why I would go look at that. But it, it was interesting. So over there in Germany, these guys are massively popular. So again, it's, I think you'll still have some hometown heroes. Right. And then you'll have the mega, the mega vendors. And at some point, I think... And even myself, if there's a way I could get off of Office 365 and feel comfortable doing that or have an alternative, I would go to it. It just doesn't, there's not, if there isn't an alternative, you can't go anywhere. So there's something to be said about people do want to have some choice. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, kind of looping this back into the cloud uh, explosion, um, what you're finding is that there are not no small players anymore, right? If you can get to the cloud, with your solution, uh, you can compete with the big people. Yeah, so when I went to IBM World of Watson, there was a wonderful keynote speaker. I wish I knew who he was, but he inspired me. And it was interesting, he opened with the power of one. How he as a journalist, you know, had this you know popular book and top writer. Yeah. When he was driving into the parking garage, some guy in, in the parking garage attendant asked him, will you please look at my, please look at my blog online. And so he didn't really pay too much attention to it, but he's a nice guy. And the guy, you know, I sent him an email and he took a peek at it. He says, wow, this is really good. He's, oh. he's, and he said at that point, and this was maybe about five, six years ago, he said, at that point, he realized what he called the power of one, that this one person could reach the world and far surpass anything that he could do with all of his, you know, limitations in what he as a journalist could, could do. Interesting. And it was, it was a very fascinating, and I thought about it, and now, uh, you know, I've certainly been given pressure about my blog before and the influence that it has in the market. Um, you know, I'm like, I'm just one person. Why is it, why, who cares about me or this mega right. company? But yeah, it's very serious. So the power of one is very real because they're the tools here now to reach the whole world. Well, you know, that's that's interesting that you say that. And I, I agree with you completely on that power of one. Um, you know, we see that positively. You know, we see that like that person who was asking for uh, the, the help from the journalist. Um, I've seen it with you, Jen, with the uh, the influence that you wield. And 
it's uh, I think you know you're trapped inside of there with you, so it's hard for you to see what we see when we read JenUnderwood.com and the stuff that you put out. I, I'm not surprised at all that someone would be very concerned about a review from you, either positively <laughs> or negatively. It's a, you, you write very, very well. Uh, you have, again, all of this experience that you bring uh, to bear. And I think people are really listening to what you have to say about these tools. And that's one of the reasons why Frank and I, when we started thinking about starting this uh, podcast, Data Driven, uh, you were the very first person I thought of. Aww. And uh, I suggested to uh, to Frank, let's, let's reach out and see if Jen will, will, will carve out a half hour or an hour to speak with us. But, you know, not only that, that's, I think those are mostly positive things, but I think we're also seeing some of the negative effects of the power of one, too, with things that are going on um, with influence in the media and I'm, I'm reading a, an interesting book right now called Trust Me, I'm Lying. Uh, don't know if you've heard of this book. <laughs> no, this sounds good, though. It is, it's a fascinating uh, book. The, the guy is a self-proclaimed media manipulator. And he's basically, uh, you know, one of these agents of spin. And he talks about how he would, um, you know, create fake news, for, for lack of a better term. He's very open about it. And it's, it's very interesting to see how you can do that. And I think the, you know, certainly the Internet is structured that way. Um, in this particular case with, with this person, the, the way the media works kind of lends itself to, to him. And, and I think you've got, you know, you've got a foot in that sphere with, um, with your blog, with a very popular blog and, and a blog a lot of people um, read and take very seriously. I, I know I do. And um uh, I know uh, Frank does because I, I sent him a link to your blog when we started talking about having you on, and, and Frank liked it too. Am I right about that? Frank? Absolutely. I love your blog. I mean, it's, it's, it's got great content. Uh, before we were recording, I was telling you how I love the animations. So uh, if you're listening to this, stop what you're doing now, hit pause, go to jenunderwood.com, and um, check it out. It's, 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 it's everything a website should be. It should be great content presented nicely and it just it's just it might be the most perfect website that there ever was oh my gosh okay so that's over the tops but what i will say <laughs> so let's talk about the solution i think it's well today. deserved oh thanks I, I, I love doing it so it's a lot of content that normally you would have to pay a gartner or forester to get that information um there are there are time consuming hands on reviews of these products again that's what makes me different than a lot of these other ones so what i found out they read the blog what i will say as a cautionary tale is i've had a lot i've had an endless list of people that want their product reviewed for free and i can't and won't essentially cuz a, a lot of times a solution review would be say an endorsement i can't even tell you how many people i've turned away to say mm, you know it, it, that that just and that shouldn't be a solution review. That that no, I, I'm uncomfortable posting that on this blog. Wow. Um, so that's been that's been an interesting thing to navigate. When I posted Domo, I have two Domo blogs, a Domo Exposé. It was really because they were naughty, and wow. I decided I was so tired of their ridiculous tactics. And the, they were lying, and they were hiding intents and making people sign NDAs and being ridiculous. I thought for sure if there was ever a blog where I would get sued, I thought for <laughs> sure it would be this one. And it's by far one of the most popular ones of all time. Wow. I've had calls from vice president of, of massive, massive fortune, maybe fortune 50 company, call me up and tell me I was dead right. Wow. Um, and I'm like, oh my wow. God, that's really good to know. Besides a zillion other calls, of, you know, people would say, well, you know, I didn't give enough credit here. Or I did give them too much credit or whatever it was. But, um, yeah, when you do blog, you always take the risk. What I will say is the trolls came out for sure. Not, mm -hmm. not after, actually not after the Domo. I had a couple people grumble, but it, they were, they, I will give Domo bazillions and bazillions of credit. I don't even know if that's the right term. They never, ever lashed out at me. They've always been respectful. And I gave them a little nicer one, and then they were ridiculous at Tableau Conference. So I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're being ready again and now they're attacking another one uh, another group called data ram and i'm like oh my gosh here we go again but yeah you have to you do have to be really careful i would say the biggest things that i've noticed is i um the whole microsoft sales field went nuts about my tableau versus 
Power BI, again, one of the most, and this was Power BI V1, I haven't done a V2 um, at this point. And the amount of backlash from that has been very, very um, amazing to me. I'm like, it's one blog, it's one person, and you've got thousands of other compare blogs, thousands. So that was really revealing to me at, at how seriously people take these things. So I'm very cautious now when I do a review or when I do a compare, and I haven't been really doing too many compares. I may do, I may do a little bit more here and there. I'm waiting for my non-compete to end, which will really open up the ability of what I can write. But it was revealing to me that people literally would do just about anything to control my voice and to scare me and to be trolls. And it was amazing. I'm like, who cares? I said, if you think you're going to shut down the blog, you know, unless I have an order from the court, I'm not shutting it down. Wow. It was, it was just ridiculous over. Wow. And I, if you read that blog, it's, it's part of BI versus Tableau. It's, if you look up, you'd probably find it's ranked real high on Google and whatnot. I was gentle on Microsoft at the time. I had vendors click tech call me and said, wow, you guys, you were really easy on them. Literally mm. call me up and tell me that. And I said, mm, I didn't think I was too easy on them, but I, I did give them the benefit of the doubt. But people went nuts over that thing. So you got to be careful with a blog, I guess is my bottom line. It, is you just yeah. never know what to expect. I never expected the, the backlash that I got from that. And like I said, it wasn't really that bad. It well, was just honest. Yeah. And, and you know, it's surprising. Um, I've had a blog out for years. Frank's had a blog out for years. It's surprising what kind of hits, you know, it's like, where does the lightning strike? <laughs> and you'll pour hours. And in, in some cases, I've spent weeks crafting a blog post and, you know, it, it gets a relatively small audience and a couple of likes or retweets or whatever. And then I write this little stupid thing out there, you know, a couple paragraphs and it goes crazy. People are referencing it five years later. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I want to do a machine mo uh, learning model to figure out how what's that secret sauce, what's that secret formula. Because uh, I've had the same thing, you know. I'll pour my heart out, and you know, it gets like three or four views. There is I a just data kind of... set, by the way, on that, Frank. There is. Yes. Um, Interesting. I, it, let me see. I, I, know, I know the name of it. I'll open it up, and I know the name of it, but I can't. We'll put that in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, for that because that's definitely something that would be that would be interesting because I, I, I can't there's got to be more to the secret of kind of web traffic than just clickbait titles um, I think right. there's it was online some... news popularity which would be very similar for a blog too and how many shares and whatnot I'm trying to think where did I get this one I'll look and see if I can find where I got it and send it to you all afterwards oh, cool. that'd be great all right so we want to be respectful of your time and our listeners time so we want to keep the show to around 40 45 minutes um, when you're not working, when you're not, uh, influencing, um, the data industry or harassing people <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> or being harassed at various tech providers by not giving them glowing reviews, uh, what do you do? What do you do for fun? So I'm an outdoors person and I love animals. So usually we're trying to, we're walking dogs, we're taking hikes, going to the zoo, snorkeling, boating, those type fishing, those types of things, outdoors. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Getting that back to cool. nature. So um, I'm going to skip one of our questions that we have here, and uh, I want to ask this one. Um, com complete this sentence, if you will. I, I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Cook dinner. And I know technically Watson <laughs> something or other does because I sassily said that to somebody and they went and sent me the link and proved me that it's already there. Wow. But I think I think both my husband and I, we're not the best housekeepers in the world. It's not awful, but it's definitely not good. Both of us <laughs> never know what we want because I'm always, you know, on some, not to diet, but healthy food. I find healthy foods impossible. Like you got to go through these cookbooks and it's, you know, this massive exercise. I'm like, why can't we just have like instant healthy food? I hear so that. That's what I want. I want easy, healthy food. 3D printing of food. It's on the way. Oh, there you go. That, that would be interesting. Yeah. Printed 3D food. Um, related to that, what do you think the coolest thing in technology today is? 
Ooh, so I'm obsessed with virtual reality data visualization. It's really fun. There's a couple different vendors out there. There's an, you know, and there's certainly a couple more in stealth mode right now, but I've been seeing what they're building. It's fun because it's so darn different. Yeah. And the user experiences, you don't really know what to do. You get lost. Sometimes you get a little sick or feel uncomfortable. And you're like, what on earth am I looking at? Yeah. But it is going to just alter. And I don't even really know if it's virtual reality. I think once it becomes all augmented reality, but the same kinds of techniques will, will still apply. It's this idea of immersing yourself in data and really exploring it. So take somebody that's completely nuts about data like me. Oh, give me your data set. And I'll be like, hey, Leah, give me your data set because it's, it's like a rush. It'll be like a ride at, at the Universal Studios. Oh, I completely uh -huh. agree with you. And I, I know some folks who have uh, who are in stealth mode playing around with that, uh, that 3D, um, you know, immersive experience of walking around in virtual reality data. The feedback that I've gotten from my couple of friends who are playing with that has been mixed. And, you know, they thought originally it would be really cool. And as they used it a little bit, you know, they didn't really, they didn't get into it that much. But the augmented reality pieces, I agree with you. I think that's way more fascinating. Um, as, you know, as you're walking along, have, uh, you know, have some mapping software, do an overlay uh, based mm -hmm. on your camera and start feeding you facts about buildings and roads and uh, linking it to your calendar and, and that sort of stuff. I think that's uh, definitely a field that's coming. And um it's going to be super cool when it does. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is going to be the secret sauce that will make kind of AR, VR mainstream. Yeah. It will. So, yeah, that's anyways, that's the one I'm most excited about right now. Um, well, one, we do have one, one real last question. I thought Frank was going to ask this, but I'm going to jump in. Um, okay. Share something different about yourself. Um, but we have this caution here. Remember, it's a family podcast. So uh... <laughs> so I have this vision, for as much as I love tech, of living on an island, possibly in a treehouse. I don't know if Donald Farmer got me you know, intrigued with because he builds these treehouses or not. But <laughs> this whole concept of going back to nature, except I kind of want to keep my computer and internet. So if I can combine this, this is, this is my dream. My husband always asks me, what, what, you know, have you looked at places to live? And we have a nice place to live where we're at right now, but we're, we're thinking about moving. And mm. I said, babe, I just haven't seen the treehouse on the island yet. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what I want, and I'm, I want that. <laughs> no, I like that. I, it's got that, that kind of Robinson Underwood feel to it. You know? <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> I like that. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. That's, uh, that's something to shoot for, for sure. It's a goal. Absolutely. Cool. Treehouse on an island. I like it. Well, Jen, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be our very first guest here on Data Driven. Uh, Frank, thank you for setting up all of the technical stuff. Frank is the technical guru on recording and, and all things that way. Um, and it's been a real honor for, for me. I'll speak for myself. I will say for us as well to, uh, to speak to you about this stuff. Looking forward to uh, putting this out there, getting feedback from others. And... Um, we really appreciate you being our very first guest on Data Driven. Thank you, Jen. Oh, it's an honor, Andy. So let me know when you have more and add me to your mailing list. Awesome. Great, definitely. Uh, so thank you, Jen, for joining us. And uh, for those of you out there listening, be sure to subscribe, like, and review this podcast. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, frank.lavinia at gmail.com or andy.leonard at gmail.com. You've been listening to Data Driven. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.